Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Brunel. Um, my name's Phil Collins. I'm the Vice Dean for Education in the College of Engineering, Design and Physical Sciences here at Brunel University, London. Um, so I'm the, the school compare for the evening. Um, I, I get to do the uninspiring bit before you get to hear the very inspiring bits that uh, uh, Alex will deliver in a short while. Um, before I start, there's a little bit of housekeeping. I think quite a few people in the room are Brunel people, but not, not, uh, there's not, there are some unfamiliar faces. Um, so the first thing is um, Alex is going to be uh, asking you if, you've, if you want to, to enter some polls during her talk. So if you'd like to join the Brunel guest Wi-Fi, um, there's a link um, on the screen now. It's good timing. Um, and uh, you can join in uh, without any too much hassle, hopefully. Brunel University is uh, a university that's got a very long history of links with people across society and organizations across society. And that includes the sort of more traditional industry links, uh, so companies and organizations uh, for us in engineering, uh, the major manufacturing groups, the uh, construction firms and so on, uh, but also local and national government and quite a large work, a lot of work with the third sector and charities. Um, that's been really important to Brunel right from the start. It's made us uh, relevant, it's given us a focus, it's given us a lot of inspiration, and it's helped us change lives uh, for our students, but also a long way beyond that. Um, some of the highest impact relationships that we've had have been through the Royal Academy of Engineering's Visiting Professor Scheme, and we've had a number of quite select and inspirational engineers who have joined us over the years. And they all bring something different, they all bring something special. And they help particularly our students, they uh, directly connect with the students, uh, but also they uh, support the staff, they give us ideas, they give us advice, they keep us in touch with the real world, so that when we deliver to our students, the students are prepared. And that shows through in a lot of our statistics. Uh, when you um, look at things like social mobility, we see that our students do much better than you might expect. And that's in part down to uh, the Royal Academy visiting professors. Um, they all leave us with a po positive legacy. They all leave us with things that we can carry on doing and carry on improving. Um, so Alex Knight, who's sat here, if you haven't noticed her, um, she's uh, one of our Royal Academy visiting professors. She joined just under three years ago, I think now. And um, she's been continuing and extending that um, inspiration. And that's uh, hopefully something that will carry on uh, over the next few years. Uh, now, many of you will probably know Alex or have heard of her um, through various networks. Um, my daughter, who's doing, uh, she's a graduate engineer, uh, the other day said, oh, it's that Alex. Um, so, uh, and she, her supervisor is somebody who Alex is working with now. Um, so uh, there's quite an interesting network around her. Um, she actually started uh, as a Brunel graduate. Well, she started as a Brunel student. Um, but she graduated with a BEng in mechanical engineering um, and went on from there to do a whole range of different activities in um, a variety of roles. Uh, and through that, she's developed quite a strong profile professionally. So um, you know, she's a hardcore engineer in many ways. She is a chartered engineer. She's a fellow of the Institute of uh, Mechanical Engineering. And she's also a fellow of the Women's Engineering Society. So she's, uh, she's very well recognized, and she's got a, a very strong professional portfolio. Um, her career has been diverse. She's done a whole range of different things. I think she started out, you were saying, with uh, asthma diagnosis and monitoring tools and developing and designing those. Um, she moved on and did some re uh, designed some rehabilitation equipment for injured soldiers at Headley Court, which uh, I think everybody would understand is a really important thing to do. And she's been delivering asset management of power distribution in Thailand as well. So, um, so she's done hardcore proper me mechanical engineering, if you like, all the way through to uh, people management within a, an asset management framework. Um, 
she's recently, or until recently, she was a technical director with the engineering firm Amy. And that's, I think, when we first got to know each other, uh, that's where she was. And she was leading a, a fairly uh, innovative and advanced project on digital asset management in infrastructure, uh, which is really cutting edge now. That's something that we are trying to grapple with uh, in the education sector. Um, from that, she's also been a, an international standards committee member. So that's, again, something recognizing her professional status and her expertise. Um, and is contributing towards asset management standards globally. Uh, again, big impact there. That's the traditional engineer. Uh, alongside that, Alex has developed a very passionate interest in diversity and inclusivity in engineering. And she's done a whole range of different activities. Uh, one of the most notable recognized was that she was a trustee on the board of directors of the Women's Engineering Society, um, which is a very progressive group who are driving the agenda very strongly in the UK and, and internationally. From that, she decided that rather than following the traditional engineering route, she would go and do something a bit risky. And she set her own um, company, which is a social enterprise. And that's called STEMazing. Um, which is, when I first heard it, I thought, oh, that's a strange name, but it really is. It's about STEM, and it's, about, it's amazing. Uh, and it, she focuses on working with two groups. So she works with uh, female engineers, so people who are already in engineering roles or moving towards them, um, but also with children. Uh, so she has STEM, STEM amazing women and STEM amazing kids as the two sort of themes. And when you, if you look at what they do, uh, it is really quite remarkable. Um, if you want to find out, there's, um, if you look up STEMazing on LinkedIn and Facebook, you'll find loads of examples. Um, I, I think, Alex, you are a bit of a social media fiend, aren't you? So uh, there's a, a constant stream of stuff coming out, but it's, it's, it's really good, from very little children all the way up to very experienced engineers are uh, um, being inspired and developed. Um, so that has all been, that and her professional activity have led to um, Alex being awarded a number of uh, international and national awards um, and um, being very well recognized by a variety of different sorts of organizations. So more recently, as I said, Alex has joined us as a Royal Academy visiting professor. And her focus has been on the asset management. So that was kind of where I'd started when we first thought, thought oh yeah, we need an asset management input. But increasingly, it's been linking that with inclusivity and showing how having diverse groups of people working together and recognizing all those people uh, is really important to successful projects and uh, you know, not ruling out a whole load of expertise and talent. And she's been working particularly with students, um, but also running webinars with Maria, um, Maria Colacatroni, who's sat here, um, for staff as well. And I know those have been very popular. We had an incredible number of people turn up for those. And also, um, they've led to quite a lot of discussion and ideas. So already we're seeing a positive impact from that. And we're definitely seeing a positive impact for the students as well. So that's very, very impressive. Now, the final thing, or one of the, probably the final thing I will say, is put that in the context of not only just setting up your own company, and working with us. Alex moved house. We had a pandemic, which complicated things a little bit. Um, and uh, she also had Storm Eunice, which also complicated things by taking out all the power grid um, where she lives. So um, she has been incredibly resilient through that and not lost any of her passion, her energy, uh, and her ability to inspire. So I think I, I will stop there. I'm going to pass over to Alex, who's going to talk us about how engineers solve problems and how we should be solving problems as well. So over to Alex. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Phil, for that really lovely introduction. I really, really appreciate that. And thank you so much to everybody who's turned up here in person tonight. It's so good to see people in 3D. And hello to those of you at home as well who are watching. I know a number of you said you were going to join us live streaming, so thank you to you as well. 
So, I am very, very honoured to be here, and uh, it's definitely very important to me to be supporting Brunel and to be back here. As Phil said, I did my degree here quite a few years ago now, um, and it's been an amazing experience coming back to Brunel as a visiting professor. So what I'm going to talk to you about is engineers solve problems. What are the problems that we need tomorrow's engineers to solve? And really, what are tomorrow's engineers? What skills do they need? Because engineers are our world's practical innovators and problem solvers. They are the ones that create the practical solutions to the many problems in our world. But if we don't have the right skills as engineers and we don't have the right people who are going into engineering and the breadth and diversity of people, then are we going to be able to solve those future problems? Because we need those future solutions to be long-term, sustainable, ethical, and inclusive. That's very, very important. So I won't go into me because Phil's already given you a very extensive background into who I am and sort of what led me to Brunel. But I do just want to say that I, I feel like I've got such a special place in my heart for Brunel because my engineering journey started probably almost 25 years ago at Brunel. And uh, Brunel, I would say, if I had to say it in a nutshell, unlocked or helped me unlock my potential. I think that's what it was. So before I joined Brunel, I was an extremely shy, reserved, quiet girl. I went to an all-girls school. Um, nobody at my school suggested engineering could be a future career for me. But the idea of engineering and what attracted me to Brunel was that I came here on a summer space school in between my GCSEs and my A-levels. And that opened my eyes. I thought, this is awesome. This, I want to do something like this. And so when I ended up um, applying to universities, one of the ones I applied to was Brunel. Um, but I didn't get very good A-level grades, if I'm honest. Um, and in the end, Brunel was the only university that offered me a place to do engineering. So I ended up coming to Brunel, <laughs> sort of, that was my only choice, but obviously it was also my top choice. Um, and actually, I didn't even get the grades that Brunel wanted me to get to get into Brunel University. But after an interview here, they said, look, you can come in even if you don't get these grades. And so Brunel gave me a chance. I came to Brunel, I had a fantastic time here. Um, it wasn't all plain sailing, as I'm sure nobody's degree is all plain sailing. Um, I remember on my very first day walking into a lecture theatre kind of like this, um, feeling like, oh, am I meant to be here? I'd come from an all-girls school, obviously, looking around the room and seeing mainly men. Um, I think there were over 100 students and less than 10 of those were women when I started. So the contrast from being surrounded by women and girls all the time was quite shocking, compounded with the fact that I hadn't got very good A-level grades. So I kind of thought, am I going to you know, actually be able to do this? And I thought I'm coming in kind of just scraping my way in here. Um, but fast forward four years, and after a lot of hard work, after a lot of fun times as well, but also times when I did doubt myself and really felt the effects of being in the minority, I have to say. I remember one lecture when one of the uh, lads I was sitting next to said to me, uh, this is engineering, English lecture is down the hall, and he's meant to be there. And I was like, took a deep breath, no, I am meant to be here, I am doing engineering, but all the time thinking, am I meant to be here? Um, anyway, we got through all that, and I ended up coming out with a first class honours degree. And not only that, but having just scraped in, I ended up graduating top in my year. So I feel for me, Brunel unlocked that potential in me. I realized if I work hard, if I apply myself, and I seek out the right mentors, because I definitely was very proactive at going to my lecturers and asking them for help, um, then I could achieve anything. So it definitely unlocked the potential in me, and it does the same with so many students, and that's why I love this university. I see so many students that come in doubting themselves, feeling insecure, not feeling like they belong, maybe doubting their technical ability, and then thriving and flourishing, and that's what this university does. 
So I feel like that unlocking picture is something that is very kind of like a metaphor for Brunel, if you like. And in terms of our tomorrow's engineers, we need them to unlock their potential. And um, we need that because we need tomorrow's engineers to unlock tomorrow's solutions to tomorrow's problems. We need to be equipping and enabling and empowering tomorrow's engineers to unlock those world-changing innovative solutions that we need to solve our many global challenges. And we need those solutions to be relevant for the long term and to be sustainable, ethical, and inclusive. So, what are those challenges that we need our tomorrow's engineers to solve? And this is where I want the first bit of audience participation. So if you have your mobile phone, um, and those at home can also do this as well, please. If you get your mobile phone and you go to slido.com, um, you should see, uh, it should ask you for a code. And there's a code here that you can put in, 8216978. So you should be able to get onto slido.com. If you're at home, you can use your mobile phone or another window on your browser. And hopefully, you'll be able to see this question popping up, because I'd love for you to tell me what are the problems, well, that you think, what are the problems do you think that we need tomorrow's engineers to solve? So energy, one of them, absolutely, I completely agree. We need energy to, to help power an ever-growing population. We all rely on energy more and more these days. Climate change, yes. So a big, big, you know, that's our current focus and I'm sure will continue to be a focus. How do we help protect our planet and make it sustainable for us in future? So again, energy security. Now, you can see with Slido, the more people that put in the same thing, the bigger the word gets. So hence, a lot of people feel like we need tomorrow's engineers to be focusing on the climate and how we improve that. We've got plastics in the ocean, using IT, uh, drinking water, absolutely. Yep, uh, clean water, inequality, poverty. Yep, sustainability, so loads coming through there. That's great. Climate change getting even bigger. Injustice, pollution, absolutely. So you can see there are many, many challenges that are current and future, and ones that we can't even see and predict right now, that we are going to need tomorrow's engineers to help us solve. OK, thank you very much for that. I'm just going to stop that poll. Perfect. So we should go back now to my presentation. Happy days. I love it when the IT works. OK, um, when I think about the problems that we need our tomorrow's engineers to solve, the UN SDGs the um, Sustainable Development Goals, give us a really good structure and framework where it shows us like where is our focus right now. And across all of these areas that are in the UN SDGs, you can see, if you really think about it, how engineering is related to every single one of those. Now, some of them are really obvious, like energy, which came up in the poll just now, um, sustainable cities, kind of innovation, infrastructure. But actually, if you look at every single one of those, engineers will play a role in providing the solutions to those kind of challenges that we're facing. And this will just get bigger, and we need more and more engineers to help us solve these problems. So this is a great place to look when you're looking at kind of what are the areas that I might want to um, specialize in or problem area of industry that I want to go in to make a difference. And I always encourage um, young people and professionals and young professionals to have a look at the UN SDGs and think, what is it that you care about? What is it that you want to go and make a difference with the skills that you're learning? How will you apply your skills to make a difference in one of these areas? But I feel like the idea of specializing in something is quite sort of um, something that's very prominent in terms of like a pressure that's put on us at quite a young age. And I'm all for people finding their niche and um, developing their skills in a certain area that aligns with their strengths and specializing in whatever it is that they want to do. But I also feel that there is um, a danger with specializing. So this kind of question, what should I specialize in, that I hear quite a lot of young people 
asking me and talking about, and even not young people, like people who are in their career still feeling like, I need to find my niche, I need to label myself as something. Um, and I think this quote is quite nice to remember, that philosophers are people who know less and less about more and more until they know nothing about everything. And scientists are people who know more and more about less and less until they know everything about nothing. And in a way, people in STEM, us as engineers and scientists, technologists, we can relate to this in terms of trying to specialize and keep specializing and get a narrower and narrower sort of field of expertise and focus. And yes, that is good because we need specialists. We need a lot of specialists and expertise to solve all those UN SDGs and more. But there is a danger with becoming a specialist, I think, in having a very narrow field. And that is that maybe you have the risk of losing sight of the big picture. And I think having sight of the big picture, as in what is going on around you of that specialist narrow area that you're focusing on, that is vital for really creating inclusive, sustainable solutions. So being able to see the big picture is something that I talk to Brunel's students about here as part of my role as a visiting professor. And the way we do that is through a discipline called asset management. And Phil mentioned asset management. Um, this is something that I didn't really discover, I suppose, in my career until about halfway through where I am to date. Um, and it kind of was a natural evolution for me because instead of specializing, I kind of went more generalist and more high level with my engineering career from design and development through to systems engineering, through to engineering asset management and organizational asset, asset management. And as I got more involved with the Institute of Asset Management and, and involved in asset management in the projects I was doing, I just kind of fell in love with it because I love the nature of seeing the big picture in engineering systems and organizations. I love the holistic element of it. And I love the fact that you'll see it says maximizing through life value in this quote. I love the fact that it's talking about value, not just in financial terms, but value is broader than that. So how do these engineering assets that we are creating, building, operating, maintaining, how do those add value to us as humans, to our communities, to our societies? And it's not just about them making money or having a cost on the balance sheet. It's about how do they add value maybe in an environmental way or societal way. So being able to try and articulate what that value is and then maximizing that through life. So not just over a short maybe couple of years, say budget horizon, but over the life of the asset, which could be much, much longer, even longer than you're in that job or longer than your lifetime maybe, if you're talking about things like bridges and certain buildings. So it's trying to take a step back, see the big picture of how we as engineers add value that is sustainable. And I came up with my own quote about asset management because I feel like in a way when I'm communicating this to students, I need to try and make it as tangible as possible. And I feel like this asset management helps you see the big picture in engineering. It helps you connect the dots so you see where your bit fits in with the, the, everything else that other people are doing in your field and in your organization. Ultimately, so that you as part of a team, as part of your organization, can make balanced decisions about how to unlock sustainable value in whatever you're doing. And the great thing about asset management is that it's so transferable to so many areas. So in every single area of engineering, of which there are loads, and I've worked in a few of them, as Phil said, from defense to health and medical, to power, to a bit of rail, to infrastructure. Asset management is relevant in all of them because it helps us as engineers understand how we're really adding value. And so some of the things that we talk about here, what we do is we actually cover tools, methodologies, approaches that allow us to take a structured um, approach to doing asset management. So we're kind of building the toolkit of engineers so that they can go on and use these skills in a transferable way, whatever they decide to specialize in. So as I said, I'm, I'm all for specializing and finding your niche, 
but being able to step back and still see the big picture is really important for our tomorrow's engineers. And another question I get asked quite a lot is in this sort of fast paced digital um, technologically advancing world that we live in, how do we get, like, what's the right balance of traditional versus kind of modern engineering skills with modeling and analytics and data science? And in our asset management work that we do here at Brunel, we cover digital asset management as one of the strands that we cover. And digital asset management is that sort of, as I see it, the perfect sort of sweet spot combination of data science, technology, and engineering coming together to add real value. But, you know, I've put the picture of Brunel up here because when you think of a traditional engineer, you probably think of Brunel as an icon in engineering. You know, he's a fantastic engineer, respected by the engineering community. Um, and then if you think about, but what does tomorrow's engineer look like? It's probably going to be quite different to Brunel. And the skill set that tomorrow's engineer will need will be different. So understanding or kind of, and, and I don't have the right answer to this, but I feel like being able to ha have an open mind about how we use modern technology combining with traditional engineering is really important for our tomorrow's engineers. And as you look back over the developments that in society that engineers have really led the way on, so engineers have been at the forefront of developments in um, you know, since the first industrial revolution, really, and probably before that, you know, in the 18th century, when you've got the first industrial revolution with steam power and mechanization, then through into the 19th century, and then the 20th century with electronics and computers driving automation. And then in the 21st century, where we are with what's called Industry 4.0, with digitization, things like Internet of Things, so IoT, being able to use sensors to get real-time data from assets, being able to do modeling and analytics to understand how those assets are performing in real life, um, and, and even using machine learning and predictive analytics to predict how it's going to respond in future. This is how we're now combining the modern advances in data and technology with our traditional engineering skills. And it could be kind of overwhelming in a way and a bit daunting to think about how can I learn all this traditional engineering that has largely remained unchanged for quite a long time, and on top of that, all the modern engineering stuff about data science, technology, modeling. And I feel like, in a way, we don't need to worry too much about that if we empower and equip our tomorrow's engineers with the skill of collaboration and being able to work effectively in diverse teams. Because we can't be an expert in everything, but what we can do is bring diverse skill sets together and collaborate effectively to get really effective solutions. And especially when you look at this quote that says, the pace of change has never been this fast and it will never be this slow again. And that's true. The pace of change is constantly accelerating. So, in a way, how can we keep up, which we want to do as engineers, we want to be at the forefront of the developments of all the industrial revolutions and going forward to the fifth industrial revolution with personalization and human, human cyber interfaces, things like that. We want to be at the forefront of that, but how can we keep up in a way? And I think collaborating with experts from different areas is, is more than ever a really, really key skill. So I want to show you a quick video here, which is an example of one of the projects that I worked on in my last job in Amy Consulting, where we were using exactly that, that combination of data science, technology, and engineering to make leaps forward in how we manage and look after some of our most critical engineering infrastructure assets. Here at Amy Consulting, we use our engineering expertise combined with our specialism in data and analytics to make intelligent infrastructure real. This is just one example of how we're doing it on the fourth road bridge crossing in Scotland. My name is Ewan Angus. I'm the major bridges director for Amy Consulting at the fourth road bridges. We look after the bridges on behalf of Transport Scotland. It's our role to keep the two bridges safe, open, 
resilient and generally in a good state of repair. So the two bridges are pretty critical in terms of keeping Scotland and the economy moving and keeping us connected to the rest of the world. The bridges are very complicated. Um, there's probably 30,000 elements between the two bridges to keep an eye on, keep track of, and we have to look at all those elements to make sure they're all okay and kept in working order. To do that, we need a lot of data. In order to use that data, we need to turn that data into information and use that information to generate some insight into what's actually happening on the bridge and use that to make the right decisions at the right time. The array of sensors that we have installed across the bridge is constantly developing, um, so it's important to have a single unified approach to storing that data, um, analysing that data, recording what the performance of the bridge is, and for us Mercury provides that, that one-stop solution. Mercury system is a very advanced cloud-based system. It pulls together everything we need to do to go from data to decisions. There's a lot going on behind the scenes in Mercury, so to break it down, let's look at the process. We start off with our asset with a whole host of sensors. That big data is then sent up to the cloud. In the cloud, Mercury ingests and collates and stores that data and also carries out analytics on that data. We use the power of cloud computing to do all sorts of clever things in terms of analysing the behaviour and trends of those assets. We can also use machine learning algorithms for predictive analytics. The real power of Mercury is being able to make better decisions. Those decisions can have an impact on cost, risk and performance of the asset. We're very lucky here at the Fourth Bridges, thanks mainly to our investment from our client Transport Scotland and to our unique blend of in-house skills. The systems we now use to look after these bridges are the most advanced in the world. In Amy Consulting, we're passionate about doing better asset management using data and making intelligent infrastructure real. So I feel really fortunate to have worked in a team like that, where I, as an engineer, was not an expert in data science and technology, but I was working in a predominantly data science team and so that exposed me to kind of all the innovation and the ideas that we had with people who'd got a fantastic background and experience in data science and me bringing the engineering side in. So asking the right questions of how is this actually going to add value to what we're doing as engineers and what is it helping us to answer? Like what key questions do we need it to answer? How can we trust the data, et cetera, et cetera? So it was a fantastic team. And I have to say, I think the, the diversity of skills there and the diversity of backgrounds and perspectives from a very international team was the real key to that. So that's what helped us, I think, produce a solution that, as you and Angus said in there, was, was leading in the world in terms of managing bridges. Um, and if you look around us at what's happening with advances in data and tech, um, in the world of engineering, sometimes it feels like we're already living in futuristic times. Like there's so many advances that are happening at such a pace. And you look at autonomous vehicles, for example, digital twins monitoring all sorts of different types of assets, telling us how they're performing in real time, what maintenance they need, um, even in some cases maintaining themselves, self-maintaining or identifying exactly when they need to be maintained. Through to things like 3D printing, organs. I mean, that kind of stuff will transform people's lives, and that is already starting to happen. Um, there's a huge amount of engineering and technology in the healthcare industry, and we've been obviously exposed to some of that through the pandemic. But other things as well, like drones and robotics replacing human jobs. But these are the human jobs that do we even want to do anyway? You know, like here, we've got drones doing live line inspections. That's a dangerous job. As humans, if we can avoid doing that, that's a good thing, right? So we can use technology to help us advance. And as engineers, we need to be aware of how we can bring that into the projects we're doing to add most value. So it's a really, really exciting time for our tomorrow's engineers, but also potentially quite a daunting time when you think, how can I learn enough and keep up with this pace of change? And that's why um, I've kind of summarized where I feel like in terms of the kind of skills we need to equip and empower our tomorrow's engineers with. And I feel like having the skill of curiosity, and I do think it's a skill because it's something we can develop 
and improve how we can have approach problems with a curious mind, how we can keep learning and ask powerful questions, that is a skill in itself. And I know I had to do that in my team that was a very diverse team with data scientists. We need to be having the skills of asking powerful questions and judging whether the answers we're getting are realistic answers. As engineers, using our fundamental engineering knowledge to say, does that make sense? Okay, rather than just trusting the outcome from the data. And to be able to see the big picture, so going back to asset management, I think we need a curious mind to be able to want to step back and see the big picture, to see how all the different bits connect together and where this adds long-term sustainable value. I also feel like, you know, with things like machine learning and AI, replacing routine jobs, and of which there will be some in engineering that will be replaced, we need to hone and develop our skill of creativity as engineers to be able to um, really collaborate effectively in diverse teams that generate those kind of really creative solutions. And to be able to connect the dots, like I said, this is kind of going back to asset management in a way. How do you see how you can pull disparate, diverse ideas together to create a solution that actually adds value? And so I feel like that skill of creativity is something we need to really equip and empower our tomorrow's engineers with. And at the foundation here, I'd say the skill of courage. And again, you might see courage as more of an attitude or an attribute maybe, but I see it as a skill because it is something that if you proactively, intentionally work on it, you can develop and improve. And we need tomorrow's engineers to have the skill of courage because that leads on to confidence. Confidence to be able to raise your ideas and take risks. To fail fast, which you need in a very fast-paced world, be agile, and to be able to then refine. And to, in a room full of people, be the one who is able to put your hand up and raise your idea. We need those tomorrow's engineers to be the ones who are actually bringing their ideas to the fore. But that takes confidence, and I think courage comes before confidence. You have to have the courage to step outside your comfort zone, stretch yourself. And again, that can improve with intentional practice, and it's something we can help tomorrow's engineers to develop. And then courage to use the skill of critical thinking. And in our world of information overload and quite of a lot of hype, being able to see through the hype and actually critically think and be able to down-select where you want to invest your valuable time and resources in what area of innovation, that needs critical thinking. And that is a skill that we can develop. But again, I think that comes down to actually having the courage in the first place, because it sometimes maybe would mean going against the flow or swimming against the tide to be the one to critically think and say, have you thought about that, though? Or, uh, actually, I disagree. Um, and, and we want, like, I, I was interviewing young engineers coming into the business. I want those engineers that will positively challenge, positively disrupt. But that takes courage and confidence. And we can empower them to have those skills. Now, um, coming back to the problems that we are solving, we want to solve, which there are many, um, I feel like whatever problem it is that we are solving, um, to really truly create that step change in innovation, um, we absolutely need diverse and inclusive teams. And this goes deeper than the skills we are equipping our tomorrow's engineers with. This goes back to who, you know, what, who in the population are we attracting and retaining as our engineers in the first place. And this is a fundamental problem that we have in engineering. I feel like this is actually the problem that could undermine all other problems if we don't get this right. We are not attracting and retaining enough diverse talent in engineering, and we need diverse teams to produce diverse and inclusive solutions. That's the key to innovation, okay? So that's what we really, really need, and that is the problem I think we should be having a lot more focus on right now. Somebody actually put in the Slido poll, I think, inequality, so it links to that. And 
just in design alone, if you look at the danger of lack of diversity in design, one example I want to give here, there are many, many examples, but one example of crash test dummies, crash test dummies that are designed based on an average man. And because cars are then designed to be safe in the tests that they do with crash test dummies, cars are designed to be safe for an average man. And the reason we know this is because although men do dominate the stats in uh, car accident stats, because men have more car accidents than women, they're involved in car accidents more frequently. But when women are involved in car accidents, they are 47% more likely to be seriously injured, 71% more likely to be moderately injured, and 17% more likely to die. And this is, all comes back to who is the car designed for. Men and women have fundamentally different physiology, and the way that the car is designed to be safest is for the crash test dummy test, which is the average man. So there's now quite a lot of research. This was really highlighted in a book by um, Carolyn Creator Perez called Invisible Women. And she did so much research looking at all of the problems of inherent bias in design where women have not been included in the design sort of testing and design um, fundamentals to design for women. Okay, so there's a lot of amazing examples in there. I say amazing, they're pretty depressing, but it's really eye-opening. And I think that book should be fundamental, like mandatory reading for all engineers. And it's not just physical design. If you look at software design, AI, where the data sets that the AI has been trained on are predominantly white men, then you can see why the AI, things like voice recognition, facial recognition, has real problems with anybody who's not a white man. And that may seem like like a bit jokey maybe and like it's kind of funny if Alexa doesn't recognize my voice but it will respond to my husband but when you look at using facial recognition for things like law enforcement then mismatching say a black woman's face to a mugshot um, can have devastating consequences and that has happened so we need to get this right. We need to have more diversity in design because the lack of diversity in design is extremely dangerous. But it's not just in design. Um, generally in business, diversity is an absolute no-brainer. Um, loads and loads of stats to support this. So like, you know, McKinsey, Harvard, EY, so many really extensive research studies now to show that diversity in business is just a no-brainer. Companies that are more diverse are twice as likely to meet or exceed their financial targets, three times as likely to be high-performing, six times as likely to be more agile and innovative, which is exactly what I'm talking about in this talk today, and eight times as likely to make better, uh, to, to make better decisions okay, and have better business outcomes. These stats are from Deloitte. So it's an absolute no-brainer in business in general but in engineering, it's essential that we get greater diversity into our engineering workforce and then into the designs that we're creating. And one really good piece of news is that the Engineering Council AHEP, AHEP so the Accreditation for Higher Education Programs, now has a greater focus on diversity and inclusion, sustainability, um, inclusive design, and making sure that um, their, that engineering degrees, if they want to get accredited, have strengthened um, their inclusion of equality, diversity, and inclusion in their programs. So that is really good news. That was fairly recent, 2020, that came out. Um, but I also feel like the problem goes a lot deeper than that. We need to be looking at kind of why we don't have more diversity in engineering full stop. Um, and this kind of really showcases the problem here. These stats are from Engineering UK, that we always have a shortfall of engineers every year in, in this country. So we need more engineers. We have only 16.5% women in engineering currently. So looking at the gender diversity piece, we have a long way to go before we reach gender parity. And if you look at why this is, why don't we have enough people going into engineering and why do we not have enough diversity in engineering? 
one of the stats shows that 73% of 11 to 14 year olds don't know what engineers do. So how are we gonna get more people into engineering and especially more girls into engineering if people just don't know what engineers do? So um, I feel like one of the big problems we have in engineering is this engineering stereotype. I'm gonna bring up Brunel again, no offense to Brunel, I think he's a great guy, but when you think about engineers, you tend to think of someone like Brunel, okay? Uh, a white middle-aged guy. Um, I did a Google search for images of an engineer and this was the top one that came up. Again, a white middle-aged guy wearing a hard hat. And I mean, the Royal Academy of Engineering are doing an amazing job changing the face of engineering and getting lots more images out there that are diverse and show the breadth of engineering, which is fantastic but it feels like it's just not quite happening fast enough and there's just such a massive barrier to overcome that it's just not making enough headway still. So there's so much more to do to um, open people's eyes to what engineering is and to show that engineering can be for everyone. And this last image here, this is also an engineer, but maybe not someone you would naturally associate with engineering when you first see her. This is Beverly, who's a mentee of mine at Brunel, and she's doing civil engineering. And like me, when she first introduced herself to people and says, I'm an engineer, there's normally a bit of a surprised look. And that is because in all of us, we have ingrained unconscious bias about who should or can do certain types of jobs. And we still have this ingrained from us from such a young age of naturally what we think of as girls' jobs and boys' jobs. And it's one of those things that I have to say I've experienced, and unfortunately Beverly has as well, is that these kind of stereotypes and biases have an impact. They grind you down over time, and it can undermine your confidence and make you feel like you don't belong. So it's something is vitally important for attraction of fresh talent into engineering, but also retention of existing talent in engineering, so we don't lose the talent that we have. And um, when I started Stamazing, um, which as Phil said, is a not-for-profit, so really focused on diversity and inclusion, one of the first things I did was a little study of schoolgirls about their perceptions in engineering, so I wanna share that with you now. <laughs> Frontline workers during the COVID-19 pandemic. The coolest thing I've done in my job is crash tested a sports car, a Jaguar F-Type. I've been in the middle of the sea on offshore oil and gas platforms. I have to say, being a toy engineer and working out in LA and New York for some of the world's coolest toy brands have been part of a team that has built one of the largest offshore wind farms in the UK. I've worked on water and water sustainability projects. We need more engineers full stop, but particularly more women in engineering. Really, there's just no end to the amount of amazing things you can do as an engineer. It's a great career to choose. So that was one of the first things that really showed me this is why I want to focus on this. So I ended up leaving my job as a technical director at Amy Consulting and focusing on Stamazing full time because I feel like this is the problem that I want to be a part of solving. This is a problem that we need a lot more focus on and dealing with it as a sideline issue, focusing on other things at the same time is just not feasible. This is what I wanted to dedicate all my time to helping. And when you can see, compared to the kind of stereotypes that girls still have about engineering, like work with metal, fix cars, 
Yes, engineers do that, but they do so much more. And then when you compare that to what the, the women at the end were saying they did, I mean, do you agree? That's really inspiring, hearing those women say what they do. And if we could get that message out more with visible role models telling the world, not just children and girls, but everyone, what they do, I think the perception and the stereotypes of engineering would improve and be more diverse, therefore attract more diversity and therefore help us be more innovative. And this stereotype bias starts so young. Research shows that children between the age of three and five already have less support for counter-stereotypical career choices, like a girl wanting to be an engineer. So it's ingrained in us for, from such a young age. And then female role models, though, are a win-win, which is a plus. So if we get more female role models engaging with kids, then we found that uh, girls found it quite empowering. So they felt like they would belong in a STEM job. And, but boys didn't feel like they'd be any less respected. Boys felt like they would be equally respected and yet had a more equitable view of women in STEM. And that comes back to unconscious bias that we have in the industry, that we need everybody to have less unconscious bias to make the workplace more inclusive. So I feel like female role models is such a positive win-win for boys and girls. And that if we can get that engagement as early as possible with children, it has maximum effect. So research shows that as well. So we want to target children as young as possible with female role models in STEM. That is a way that we can really help challenge that stereotype bias. And that's what I'm really focused on now in Stamazing. And as Phil has already said, two key themes with some amazing women and some amazing kids. And the key thing being, you can't be what you can't see. We all need role models. And especially for girls wanting to do a career like engineering, role models, seeing a woman engineer is so powerful. And this is just some of the stuff that we do. So I set up a thing called the Inspiration Academy, which is, again, really trying to tackle that problem of diversity in engineering and STEM more broadly. And these, basically, I support women in STEM to be more confident, visible role models and more confident with public engagement. And then they deliver Stamazing Kids sessions live into primary schools. And in the first year of running this, we had over 100 women take part. They all ran six uh, sessions to a class of 30 kids. So overall, so far, we've had more than 20,000 individual amazing kids experiences for for these young kids and that just shows what you can do in one year of me alone running this program so if we scale that you can see the impact and that's why i feel like we can all do more to be visible role models and support and empower others to see the benefits of diversity and inclusion and it's not just insta amazing that i'm focusing on visible role models so back here at brunel with the work that i do as a visiting professor in the asset management module that I deliver, I bring in guest expert speakers who all bring in real life case studies that they work on um, and all different areas of asset management from data science through to um, investment decision making through to modeling, innovation, um, what else have we got on there? Circular economy, sustainability. So these are all um, experts who work in industry who I bring in to give real life case studies to bring that theory that we're discussing to life and giving those students a range of different industry awareness and real life project examples. But as you can see, they're all women. And so I'm really um, sort of very passionate about giving all students, men and women, visible female role models to um, see in industry that are really successful, doing really well in their jobs. Um, so this is really important to me. And I feel like this is one of the key enablers that's going to unlock that problem of diversity and inclusion in engineering, which ultimately we desperately need for the future innovation. So just adding to that pyramid of three C's that I came up with earlier, I feel like to add to the skill of curiosity, when you look at a DNI diversity and inclusion angle, to create tomorrow's inclusive engineer, which is what we're really aiming for, being curious, not just about technology and advances in data analytics and things, but being curious and open-minded about people and people's potential and people's strengths, who you work with in your team and beyond. 
and being able to have that skill of empathy to work really well with people. That is going to be key for inclusive teams. With the skill of creativity, being able to actually seek out diverse perspectives and avoid groupthink. So groupthink is where you just go with the kind of the consensus in the room because you don't want to challenge that. Um, and that kills creativity. Groupthink is the opposite of what we need for innovation, but it happens all the time. I've been in countless meetings where we've had groupthink killing creativity. And we need to empower our tomorrow's engineers to use their skills of creativity, use their courage to actually challenge that groupthink and therefore generate much more creative outcomes. And again, with the courage piece, actually having the courage to be a visible role model and to be an advocate for inclusion. And again, I feel like this is a skill that we can equip and empower our tomorrow's engineers with because it's not something that you automatically would learn or kind of um, develop as you grow up and as you go through your education. It's something that needs proactive, intentional development. And one of the things that I have particularly focused on with empowering role models is because even very confident women that I know in STEM don't want to necessarily be seen as a role model. There's a lot of pressure on women in STEM. Almost you feel like if I fail, it means all women in engineering have failed. And we need to support and empower those women to be visible role models. And there's a lot of things you can do to help with that. And, and through Brunel and also the work I do in Stamazing, I support those women to have the tools and the skills to be able to be a visible role model. So I just want to finish coming back to Beverly, my amazing mentee from Brunel. Um, I see a, quite a few parallels with her and me when, when I started Brunel and going to her early journey, where as a woman and a black woman in the minority, it is hard and you do come across a lot of challenges. And she was really doubting her ability, really doubting that she could add any value and even said to me, I, I don't think I'm going to go into engineering. I don't think it's for me. Um, I don't think I'm good enough. Um, and so I said to her in our very first meeting, I said, well, OK, why don't you think you're good enough? Are you not getting very good grades? And she said, oh, well, I'm getting like 70 75% average. I was like, oh, OK, so your technical ability is not the problem. Your confidence is the problem. And this is exactly the kind of talent we need for our tomorrow's engineers. Tomorrow's engineers like Beverly are our future. And it, it's really quite like, I get a bit emotional thinking about this because she is amazing. And she came so close to dropping out that I feel like now, after two years of mentoring and all the other support she's had at Brunel, she's now got two industrial placement opportunities. She's in her industrial placement, thriving there. She's going to come back, finish her master's, and I hope go into engineering. But we need to create the inclusive cultures that allow engineers like Beverly to thrive. We need to empower Beverly with the skills to be able to bring her whole self to work. She's so creative. She's so artistic. This is exactly what we need in engineering. Um, so I feel like it's, it's something in, in, in that it's a responsibility on all of us to play our part to make the engineering world a more diverse and inclusive place because we all have a role to play in that. Yes, um, our future relies on our tomorrow's engineers. I truly believe that. When you look at the challenges around us and ones like we can't even see beyond the horizon, we will need tomorrow's engineers to help us improve quality of life for people on Earth and to be able to make the world a better place. We rely on tomorrow's engineers. Diversity and inclusion is a key problem. I feel like even with, you know, exacerbated by the pace of change, we need engineers that are empowered and can be able to use those, you know, curiosity, creativity, and courage to generate the solutions that are actually world-changing, that are um, long-term adding value, and that are able to be ethical and inclusive. So we need diversity and inclusion. We need a diverse workforce to be able to do that. And as I said, I really believe we all have a role to play in this. This is not somebody else's problem to solve, because this problem is not going to solve itself. We all have a role to play. 
whether we're in the engineering community or not, we will all rely on future engineers and we can all play a part in being more inclusive role models. We can mentor, we can set the example, we can be in, um, advocates for inclusion and we can help open the eyes of young people to the possibilities in engineering. So we build a more diverse engineering future workforce. Um, and we can also use those three C's to empower ourselves as well, I think. You know, we never stop learning and evolving as people, and we should all be proactively and intentionally looking to enhance our curiosity, creativity, and courage skills. And they are skills you can improve, so we can all be doing that. Um, because, you know, I think that when we look at whoever we are, whatever stage in our academic or career journey that we're on, we can all continually evolve and we can all play a part in building more inclusive cultures. And that is key so that we can then build more diverse and inclusive cultures for our tomorrow's engineers, because we need more diverse tomorrow's engineers. We need to build that diversity in our workforce. It's not going to happen by itself. We have to have a focus on this. As much as we have a focus on things like health and safety in engineering, diversity and inclusion should be a business critical priority. And, but it's not all doom and gloom. Like, I feel like we absolutely can make progress here. We can make a difference. But as engineers, we are problem solvers. This is what we do. And with the skill of collaboration, collaborating effectively with those in our own professional community and beyond, we absolutely can do this if we do it together. So thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Thank you. And just thank you very much. Before we get on to Q&A, I just wanted to say a couple of thank yous to um, people at Brunel who I've worked really closely with over the last couple of years who've been amazing. Phil, you are such an inclusive leader. Genuinely, I see that in your style of leadership. It is amazing. It's really inspiring. Um, I want to thank Adrienne Toma, who I work closely with on the um, Asset Management MSc. She is such a fantastic role model to all the students, and she's fully supportive of bringing in additional women role models to show the students. It's, it's fantastic. Um, Maria Colacatroni, who I also work closely with at Brunel, and Petra Gratton, who's not here, but she's another um, member of staff at Brunel. You were both here when I actually studied at Brunel, and you were role models to me then, and you're still role models to me now, so thank you very much. Um, and also thank you to Giselle Haywood, who's also here. Giselle runs the uh, mentoring program for women in engineering and computing at Brunel. It's a transformational program. It genuinely helps so many people, mentors and mentees, and it's just incredible. Thank you, Giselle, because you do such an amazing job. And thank you to the Royal Academy of Engineering for um, this grant to come and work at Brunel as a visiting professor because it's really transformed the relationship that I have with Brunel and I feel like enabled me to have a much greater impact with the students at Brunel. The students at Brunel are incredible. They're so diverse. They, they are dealing with a lot of things. A lot of them have real challenges that they're dealing with in their lives, like having to work to earn money, caring for relatives or other people, as well as getting their degrees. The stories that I hear from the students at Brunel are just inspiring, so we need to support and champion them as much as possible. So thank you to the Royal Academy for allowing me to come here and do more work at Brunel, and long may it continue. Thank you, Phil. Thanks, Alex. So, so thank you. And um, we, we do have time for some questions. So we've got possibly got some questions online, but um, if we start in the room, has anybody? Marianne, thank you. First question. Oh, can we get the, get the microphone? Yeah. Thank you very much. That was really, really great uh, lecture. Um, I wondered with your uh, STEM amazing uh, and particularly the kids' work, do you know what the impact is on the teachers? Because I can see that the kids love it, but it almost feels if the teachers don't buy into it, mm -hmm. you know, if all they think is, oh, that was great, I didn't have to do anything yeah. for this lesson. That's a really good question, and that is part of the sustainability of that programme. And so I do send a survey out to teachers, um, 
and a, a lot of the response is overwhelmingly positive and that the teachers really, it opens their eyes to STEM as well. Um, and I've had a couple of cases where schools have now set up STEM initiatives and STEM clubs, still using some amazing kids' resources that I let them use for free after the programme, and they have then continued to embed it in their school. Um, others have gone on to seek out like other STEM initiatives they can bring into the school as well. There is, though, a challenge that teachers are overwhelmed with the amount of work they have to do, and fitting in an extra thing is hard. So I feel like we need to support the teachers and make their life as easy as possible to bring these initiatives into their school as well. So it's something I'm continually trying to improve how we engage closely with teachers. But so far, the teachers have said they love the sessions as well and they're getting stuck in and they love seeing how inspired the kids are. So I think it's, yeah, it's something that a lot of teachers have said to me they, and something that's brought out with Engineering UK stats as well is that teachers don't feel confident giving STEM careers advice and particularly engineering careers advice. So they need us in industry and academia to support them. Otherwise, they are not going to be getting that message to the kids. So the link to the teachers is vitally important. Okay, thanks. Should we take a, an online question? Okay. Uh, to follow on from that, actually, um, Teaching and learning virtually, what does it mean for developing the desired skill set in engineering, or is this not a problem at all? So teaching and learning virtually, so yeah, what we, I mean, we've seen this so much in the pandemic, and actually, I feel like it's opened our eyes more to the possibility and the potential of how we can use virtual and online learning to enhance how and what we learn and in what ways. So it's actually enabled... For example, all of those role models that I talked about that I bring into the asset management um, module, we only had two of them who came in person to Brunel because they happened to live fairly locally. All the others came in virtually, and that was amazing. And that's not something I would have even considered doing before the pandemic. So that opened up the potential for the students to have a whole host of extra expertise and role models that they could see and then network in with which helps them then with future sort of career development and, and possibly career opportunities. Um, with this amazing kid stuff that I do, initially I was very, very skeptical about doing online live STEM sessions with young kids, thinking I'm not sure how this is gonna work. But if you simplify, obviously you have to adapt the session, simplify it, it can still work really well. And so even though we are now back in person, and we're able to go into schools in person. All of the Inspiration Academy sessions I do are still online, because it means I can match up a woman in Scotland to a school in Wales, or a woman in Africa even, which we had, and a woman in America to a school in Devon or London. And so it's opened up this world of possibility. And yes, there are some downsides to it, but I think the benefits outweigh the downsides if it's done in the right way, very cognizant of how the audience or the person sort of receiving that education is engaging with it and how they are still benefiting from it. So I think virtual learning and online learning has really opened up the world of possibility for us. Thank you. Any, is there a, another question in the room? I mean, we've got a microphone coming there as well. Okay, well, thank you for a very interesting lecture. Um, I have a question, the first question. Um, certainly, I agree with you about the, this issue uh, about diversity, but I think there is possibly another problem, um, a cultural problem, I think we have, mm -hmm. particularly in the UK, in terms of not having a clear definition of what an engineer does and who mm -hmm. an engineer is. Yeah. Um, so if you go, for example, to Germany, there is a very clear definition of the status of, of, of an engineer. Mm -hmm. But here, with absolute no disrespect to people who do plumbing, I think those are very essential jobs. Uh, mm -hmm. But you know, you can actually become a plumber, who is also called nowadays regularly an engineer yeah. by doing a crash course in, in three months, six months. Mm. Um, and also, somebody who does A-levels and goes to university degrees is also called an engineer. So, mm. and, and they do different things. Uh, I'm not implying that you know, one is more important than the other. Yeah. All I'm trying to say is that there is a clear definition. Mm -hmm. and I think that might have some impact upon the, the youngsters uh, 
wanting to become an engineer. I think one of your slides was clearly showing that, you know, yeah. what is an engineer? Do I do heavy metal working? What is it exactly that an mm. engineer is? So that was my first question. My, my second question is with regards to um, engineering education and um, the way that, uh, you know, some of your slides was clearly emphasizing this multidisciplinary aspect, which I, again, agree, very important. However, there is also an element of risk associated with that. Uh, I'm saying that from somebody who's been teaching engineering for uh, probably maybe taught you when you were a student <laughs> here. But uh, since you were, for example, a student here 25 years ago, you were saying the, the curriculum that we're delivering in engineering has moved on quite significantly. Mm. Now, the positive aspects are that we have introduced the diversity, so we have groups of um, students uh, with different kind of backgrounds and skills working on the same project, which is very important. But the risk is that we have diluted the fundamentals in our engineering, and there is only limited time. So again, this is a unique thing about the UK, where we, we have compressed everything in three years course. Again, mm. compared to other European countries, mm. it's significantly less. Yeah, uh, we're trying to do everything in three years course. So, at the risk of diluting things. Mm. Sorry, yeah. So, question took too long. <laughs> <laughs> so your first question about sort of the professionalization of engineering. Um, this is a very hot topic that has been going on for years with the institutions. So, you know, a lot of professional engineering institutions, the discussions inside those walls are how do we sort of protect that uh, role of engineer? And obviously, you can become chartered and you can be a chartered engineer, which gets you the certain level of status. But actually, protecting the term and almost um, stopping people who are not chartered engineers using the word engineer has been going on for absolutely years, and I, I don't have the answer to that. I see, I think I've become more open-minded about that in a way as I've gone through my career and certainly my um, involvement with Stamazing, in that I'm trying to get more visible female role models. A lot of them are coming to me with imposter syndrome saying, but I'm not actually an engineer. I don't have a degree in engineering, so I can't be a role model. Um, but they work in engineering, and they are doing engineering pretty like high level engineering jobs. They may be project managing engineering projects. They may be working in teams that are engineers, but they're not actually an engineer. And I, st I still feel for me that I'm, I want them to be visible role models because we don't have enough of them. I want them to out be out there inspiring young people to open their eyes. But I do agree that it's sort of that balance of like, you don't want it to become, I don't think, elitist. Um, but you also want it to be something that is aspirational. And getting that balance is quite hard, and I still see the argument, which obviously has been going on for years within the professional institutions trying to resolve that one. But yeah, it is another, I completely agree that it's a challenge that the confusing um, name of engineer is why people don't understand what it is, and therefore they think, I don't understand it, I'm not gonna do it. So I completely agree that's another fundamental root cause problem. Um, your second question about trying to fit in loads of extra stuff into a short time for a degree. Again, I think the more we can, um, the sort of the skills I put up there, like collaboration, uh, critical thinking, um, being able to look at uh, working in diverse teams, that can be woven into working on a project about thermodynamics. Like that could be easily woven in, which I'm sure you do anyway, into the actual sort of hard technical engineering development. I do hear the, the uh, sort of question about how do we fit more about diversity and inclusion into the syllabus? What are we then going to have to drop? And I feel like it's, it shouldn't have to be that we are dropping something. We should be able to bring in extra equality, diversity, and inclusion into every subject we're teaching bring in examples of diverse role models when you're talking about case studies, bring in examples of the danger of lack of diversity in design when you're talking about design in, I don't know, automotive mechanics. I, I feel like there's got to be opportunities where we can actually sort of have two birds with one stone in terms of hitting diversity and inclusion as well as the technical learning. And that's what we need to try and maximize. And then how you manage to actually you know, if there are areas where you need to drop something to fit something else in, that's got to be a decision where 
you use your best judgment, I suppose. And I'd, again, I don't have the answer for that. And it is a challenge, but I feel like it's such an important area that in my view, in my honest experience as an engineer, I think I have you know, not used by any stretch everything I learned at university in my job. So I feel like there is opportunity to refine that to be more industry specific. And things like collaboration, um, critical thinking, seeing the big picture, the, some of the asset management stuff we do, certainly for me and for those teams that I've worked in has been extremely relevant in industry and help students really shine in interviews. So those kind of skills are vital. And if that means dropping something to do with, I don't know, I'll, I'll upset someone if I pick on something, but one of the maybe more <laughs> extreme technical areas, it's, it's a balance. And I think we need balanced engineers that are more open-minded and have a, a big picture view, in my opinion. <laughs> but thank you very much for the question. Okay, thank you. Do we have, a, have an online question? Um, do you think there are fundamental changes required to how children are taught to improve the unconscious bias developed at a young age? Yes, I think um, there is a lot of unconscious bias that's at a young age. Research has showed that. It's not just in education. I think it is unfortunately all around us in the TV programs that we watch, the books we read, the unconscious bias that's passed down to us from our parents and those that we interact with. So we are sort of fighting against the tide, I feel like, in that respect. But we can do more in education to just make sure that we're really aware um, of how we might be reinforcing that unconscious bias. And the more we can um, support and empower teachers to have the diverse uh, materials and educational kind of tools to be able to give kids those opportunities, I think that's where it will start to make a difference. But it is so hard when education is only an element of the influence that young people have. So I don't think we can put this all on teachers. I think it's all of our responsibility in society to make the real difference to that kind of ingrained unconscious bias. Thank you. Right. Um, are there any more there questions question in the room? room? Oh, yes. Sorry, I was a bit late. Um, <laughs> I am an electrical engineer from Ghana, and I came in 96. I had loads of children, and I had to take a break. And um, I went back to do a PGC to teach math. Now, for one of my essays, we were supposed to design a math course, and I did one for girls who wanted to get into engineering. And I, I had to have um, one of my teeth taken out. So I didn't submit my essay on time, and my lecturer didn't get to mark it. So someone else marked it and actually failed me. I'm getting emotional talking about it because everyone else did math for returners, whatever, and I did something completely different from my background. And I find that you get a lot of um, the unconscious bias, being black, yeah. a woman, middle aged, a bit mm -hmm. podgy. People look at you and when you say you're an engineer, mm -hmm. they don't give you the opportunity. So mm -hmm. you apply for jobs sometimes and your name isn't English, mm. immediately there's that bias. Mm. So um, with what you're doing, um, how, how are you making kind of strides to reach into um, minority communities so that you can use more people like me? Because I'd much rather work in something like this than to be a teaching assistant, not because mm. I don't like it, mm. but I don't get to use all of my skills. Yeah. You know? And I was the only girl in my class Mm. So I do have a lot of stories and um, encouraging stories to share with women mm -hmm. or girls about how you need to have the belief in yourself and yeah. know that you can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with any man or any boy for that matter. Yeah. So I don't know whether your, your um, organization has any openings for, because I'm not the only female engineer from Africa or Asia or yeah. who has had to shelve their career because they are in a country that doesn't recognize mm. them. Really. And it's, I'm sorry you've had to experience that, but it's you're not alone. I hear lots of stories where systemic bias is still a real issue and is affecting lots of people and particularly ethnic minorities in the UK. And in fact, students that I've mentored here have said to me their genuine concern of going to interview and being rejected because they're black and, and not wanting to put on their CV their name even because it would then 
show where they're from and they feel like that would be a negative on them. So there's that fear, but quite rightly, because it still happens, unfortunately. And uh, that is, like, I, I do focus on gender diversity in Stamazing. That's where I started predominantly. However, as part of that, because I'm proactively trying to encourage diverse people to apply, and part of my um, selection process is asking people how they will bring a diverse perspective to the program, and I leave that open for people to say how they'll do that, it actually means that I've had quite a diverse population of women coming through the programs. So ethnic diversity, I've had something like about 25%, 30% ethnic uh, minorities, so not white women, coming through, which is better than the average in the population, so that's good. I've had quite a lot of um, people with disabilities, both you know, hidden and not hidden disabilities, LGBTQ plus as well. And that's great, that's what we need. We need those diverse perspectives. One example from um, the recent program we did, we, I had a deaf engineer take part, and she translated all of my Amazing Kids activities into British Sign Language and delivered all of those sessions to a school a class of um, deaf and hearing impaired children. So she was bringing that angle of diversity into it, which is amazing. And those kids had an opportunity they otherwise wouldn't have got, which is brilliant. Um, but you know, for you personally, I would love to have you on one of my programs. And it is exactly what I'm trying to do is empower women to be role models and to find ways to sort of overcome the challenges that are placed on them. But it's not down to the individual, really. Like I said, again, it's for all of us in society to make our workplaces more inclusive, and we have a long way to go with that. But thank you for your question. Thank you. Do we have, a, we have another online question? So. I can be here all night. <laughs> um, in your experience, do engineers want to make their environments more inclusive? <laughs> uh, yes, in my experience. I, um, overwhelmingly, yes, there have been instances where there's a no. Um, more that it's not necessarily a no, like I don't agree with this, but just more why are you making this an issue? Why are you highlighting this? By highlighting it, you're creating a problem that otherwise wasn't there. And that just shows the blindness is privilege. They don't see there is a problem, therefore they don't want to be shown the problem. Um, I have come across that in a couple of instances, and therefore it just means like it kind of um, reinforces just how important it is to keep going and finding the people that do support you so that you can build that kind of momentum and keep going with it. Because you will come across people who say, I don't know why you're doing this. It's like we've been talking about women in engineering for years now, surely we're over that. No, clearly not. The stats show we still don't have enough women. So, and it's even worse with other areas, diversity. So, yeah, you will always find people, and I have found a few people, but overwhelmingly people want to support, and they see the benefit, even if they're in the majority, they see the benefit of greater diversity. And so being a majority ally, so being an ally to some, you know, if, if I'm, I'm a white woman, so I can be a majority ally to a black woman, or someone with a disability, or any, any area where I'm in the majority, we can all be majority allies to someone, and that is a really important thing to remember. And so I feel like we, we can all make a difference and see that, that it benefits us if everybody, you know, a rising tide floats all boats, as they say. So we will all benefit if we all work on this. It's not just the minority that benefits. Okay. Okay. I think we've probably got time for maybe one or two, one, one more question, I think, for the evening. Is there anybody, any burning questions in the room? No, so if we, we take one more online one and then uh, we'll, we'll finish off. Um, how do we introduce uh, diversity and inclusion into engineering curriculum and teaching that is meaningful? Um, I think making it meaningful means you need to show the benefit to everybody. So like I've just said in a similar way to the last question is don't just make it out to be benefiting somebody else. Diversity and inclusion and equality, by its very definition, benefits everybody. And we need to be showing this clearly with examples 
um, like the ones that I showed with the crash test dummies, how we can all improve society for everybody if we have more diverse and inclusive teams. And I did have a worrying um, conversation with someone actually at Brunel who was sort of saying, well, why, why do I need to worry about this? Like, why do I need support to support women's initiatives if I'm a man? And it's because it benefits us all ultimately. And unless we have everybody involved in this mission, it will fail. We can't just leave diversity and inclusion challenges to people in the minority. That is unfair. And it also won't have the big impact that we need it to. So we need everybody to be involved, and then it will benefit everybody equally. And that's ultimately what we're striving for. So to make it meaningful, we need to find a way of communicating that benefit for all. Right. OK, thank you. I think we will draw it all to an end now. Um, lots of really good questions. Um, before we finish, I just want to say that there are some refreshments outside, so um, if you want to uh, hang around for a chat, then please do. Um, I'd just like to also say thank you to Sebastian and the team at the back who have been uh, helped getting this all organised and putting it all together and making the system work properly and dealing with a little glitch with the video <laughs> just before we started, which... Um, was nicely solved. So thank you to them. Um, and thank you also to the Royal Academy of Engineering for organising the Visiting Professors Scheme. That is, it is really a truly fantastic scheme. So if you know other engineers who are out there who might be interested in working with universities, um, tell them about it if they don't know, because it, it, um, it's great for the individuals. I hope, hopefully, I think Alex will say she's learned a lot through the process. Yes. Um, but we've certainly gained enormously from it, and hopefully the students have gained even more. Um, so, uh, and there's a bit of funding that comes with it as well, just to ease it through. Um, so thank you to them. Uh, and then thank you to you in the audience here, at whichever camera you're at, so I think that one, um, at home as well. Um, it's, it's really good to see people turn up, and it's nice to know there's lots of people online as well. Um, these events are great for the community, so um, thank you for participating. It all makes us feel a bit more together. Um, and then finally, um, thank you to Alex, who uh, I think hopefully you'll agree has performed brilliantly tonight as a great speaker, but there's a lot of depth beneath what she has been talking about. Um, you know, these days we focus a lot on metrics to measure things, and there were quite a lot in there um, which tell us a lot. This isn't soft stuff, this is really important stuff. Uh, we as a community of engineers and other uh, fields as well really need to grapple properly. So Alex has brought it to a head. She's going to do fantastic work in the future as well. Um, but hopefully you join with me uh, with a final uh, big thank you to her. Thank you. Thank you.